How do you connect an external monitor to a Commodore PET? Or how do you record the video output from a Commodore PET directly instead of just pointing a camera at the screen? PETs with a 9 inch screen, like this 2001, run at NTSC compatible frequencies 15.625 kHz horizontal, 60 Hz vertical. So, although the video output from the PET mainboard is not composite, it's possible to combine the digital signals together into a composite signal that's NTSC compatible. PETs with a 12 inch screen, like this 4032, do not run at NTSC compatible frequencies. The horizontal frequency for these is 20 kilohertz, not 15. It is possible with these 12 inch PETs to install a custom edit ROM that initializes a CRT controller chip to run at 15 kilohertz instead of 20. But if you do customize the edit ROM to run at 15 kilohertz, this 12 inch screen runs at 20 kilohertz, so it won't be compatible. You can't have the video going to both at the same time. Back in March, Adrian Black made a video where he used an RGB to HDMI to convert the digital video output from the PET directly to HDMI. I thought that was a really good idea. But unfortunately, nobody seemed to have any RGB to HDMI devices in stock. And a few weeks ago, I managed to find these in stock at TechSelect. This is a fully turnkey solution. Comes with a digital RGB input. The buttons. Comes with the Raspberry Pi. Comes with the uh, SD card pre-programmed. Power cord and mini HDMI to HDMI connector. Of course, the PET doesn't have a CGA video connector on it, so I need to make a cable. The video connector on the inside is a six pin header on the motherboard. This cable runs up to the monitor. But fortunately, the PET also brings all the video signals out to the user port. So we can connect to the video signals here while leaving the monitor connected. The PET user port has the video signal output on pin two. And on pin 9 is the vertical sync, and pin 10 is the horizontal sync. The digital RGB connector, such as CGA, has horizontal sync on 8, vertical sync on 9. And for the PET, I decided to connect the video to the green input on pin 4. So here's the cable I came up with. These are the pins numbered 1 through 12. The two outside pins on either side are ground. So pin 2 is the video signal on green. Pin 9 is the vertical signal on blue. And pin 10 is the horizontal signal on orange. So we plug that into the user port here. The brown pair on the Cat5 is not used. 9 pin digital video connector goes here. And we should have the signals we need. Now we just have to make a profile that works for the correct timing. To power the RGB to HDMI, I'm just using an old USB charger. The buttons here control on-screen menus. This is a reset button. It reboots the Raspberry Pi. This brings up the on-screen menu. We have down and up, info, palette control. Geometry and sampling menu are used to set the profiles so the system knows how to digitally grab the input video signal and display it on the Raspberry Pi's HDMI output. I have set up a profile for the Commodore PET with a couple of sub-profiles that should auto-switch from a 9-inch non-CRTC to a CRTC-based 12-inch. To set up a new profile from scratch, there are a few things you need to know about the target video format. We'll start with the geometry menu. You need to know the resolution on a 40-column PET the characters are 8 pixels wide, 
times 40 columns is 320 pixels. But I'm setting this profile up for an 80 column machine and that would be 80 times 8 or 640 pixels. 25 lines times 8 pixels per character is 200 lines. The backs, horizontal and vertical, have to do with the overscan area and those can be adjusted visually later as can the pixel aspect ratios. The pixel clock on a 40 column machine is 8 megahertz and on an 80 column machine it's 16 megahertz. At a 20 kilohertz horizontal frequency that comes out to a horizontal scan line timing of 800 clock cycles. And then at a vertical refresh of 60 hertz, that comes out to 333 lines. The sync polarity is negative for both horizontal and vertical. This goes through all the different possibilities. And it is non-interlaced progressive scan. In the sampling menu, there's really only a couple things to worry about. We're set to 3 bits per pixel. This allows you to set the sync on green, but we're syncing on the sync input, so we won't be using that. You can set the sync to sync on the leading edge or the trailing edge, and we're set to leading plus delay. Once you have your settings the way you want them, be sure to come in and press save. Now if we turn on the pet, Let's see what we get. We have a picture. And it's just warming up on the CRT. I just uh, manually typed out a pattern on the screen here so we can see all 40 columns and all 25 lines. You can see over here we can see all 40 columns and all 25 lines on the screen. The cursor is in the bottom left. And uh, can see what happens when some of these settings are changed. For example, if we change the line length, you get uh, samples go off a little bit here, see? Likewise, if the clock frequency is off, Not as dramatic because it's double clock frequency, but the max H, max horizontal, if we are to change that down a bit, we get less overscan and eventually start cutting off some of the pixels. So ideally, you want to set to the actual pixel width of the screen including all the overscan. Once we get to 800 it doesn't get any wider. I have a feeling that's basically where the horizontal refresh sync hits. Same with the V height. If we take this smaller and smaller we end up cutting off the bottom of the screen. Take it out to 260 or 333 at the most, but above 268, it doesn't make any difference. Pixel aspect ratio can be tricky because if it's not set right, then you get pixels off the screen, right? And both of these will affect you. So that's about the best I could do with the 40 column CRTC. And we'll save that. Of course, this connector is actually fairly difficult to remove because there's nothing to pull on. So this is just a proof of concept. I'm going to have to make something a little bit more robust. Let's see how well it works with an 80 column pet.
8 pixels wide times 80 columns should be 640 pixels wide. So we'll need to adjust the resolution. And you can see the picture's gone out of sync until we get up to 640, hopefully. No, even at 640, we are out of sync. Let's set it to 640 and adjust the overscan. Offset can also mess with the sync. There it is. Bringing the offset back down to 72. 640 by 200. Here's where we start reducing our overscan. So that should be about right there. Leave it at 800. Leave it at 270. Okay, so again, I've put a pattern on the screen to make sure I can see all of the rows and columns. And over here, I see that I'm missing a little bit on the bottom. Go to the geometry menu. See about extending this. No. Let's try changing the aspect ratios. Two to four. Let's just try the vertical offset. There we go. Much better. And if we change the horizontal offset too far, we lose the last column. And if we make it too much, we go out of sync. So that should be about right. And we'll save that. Now switch back to the 40 column pet because I want to see if the same profile will work for the 40 or the 80 without any changes. So I want to see if the 40 column pet would work with the profile as configured for 80 columns. And yeah, it does seem to work just fine, although it looks a little off center. The uh, horizontal resolution, pixel clock, and line length are exactly double on the 80 column machines. So being exactly half on the 40 column machines, everything still lines up. It's a bit off centered, uh, but it doesn't look like we can really adjust the offset any without losing some of the screen. So we'll leave it as is, and it's nice to have one profile for 40 or 80 columns without having to change anything. I also wanted to show some of the secondary functions on these buttons. On switch one, a short press takes you into the on-screen menu, and a long press toggles the scan lines for that authentic look. On switch two, a short press does a screen capture to a PNG file on the SD card, and a long press Toggles NTSC artifacting, which I guess can't be enabled in this video mode. Switch three, a short press, refresh gen lock, and a long press does a sampling calibrate. And that goes through and fine tunes the timing to get the pixels aligned properly. So let's try this 2001 with a 9-inch screen. 
This will run at NTSC compatible frequencies. And the uh, sync signals are reverse polarity. We have a good picture here because the RGB to HDMI automatically switched, recognizing the different signals. And the geometry menu I'm still using a 16 megahertz clock frequency because these run at 8 megahertz but at 15.625 kilohertz a line length is actually 1024 clock cycles rather than 800 and I believe the um, lines per frame is 260. Here you can see the sync has been changed to positive horizontal negative vertical and on the palette menu, we've had to invert the signal because the video signal on the 9-inch screen is inverted. And here again with the pattern to make sure we're getting the whole screen. On the geometry menu, I noticed that we're off here. This should be 320. And we change the offset. Yeah, everything's still good there. We don't need to change the offset, really. And we should be 200 lines. We can bring the uh, max width in or leave it out for some more overscan. On the sampling menu, we're still syncing on leading plus delay with three bits per pixel. The phase here is auto-adjusted when you use the auto-calibrate. That looks pretty good. So there is the non-CRTC profile. Looks good, works good. The auto switch is set to sub-profile only. So if we switch over to the CRTC-based PET, it should switch profiles automatically. Here when we turn it off, we're still inverting that signal so we have an all green screen. And now, without manually changing anything, we still appear to be in the 9-inch non-CRTC profile. Turn it on, and auto switch. If you take the uh, SD card out of the RGB to HDMI and pop it into your computer, you should see this. This folder here contains the profiles. And I created a folder called Commodore PET. And within that folder, created two sub-profiles. The default.txt indicates whether or not it should auto-switch. And each profile is a text file with sampling, geometry, palette information, and so on. So I'll put this folder in a zip file and put a download link down in the description somewhere. If you make changes to a profile and save those changes, those don't overwrite the profiles in here. Those get saved to this folder. So you can make changes to your profiles and save those changes. It'll look here for them first, but you won't overwrite the profiles here. And the older Chiclet keyboard pets have the same video output as the later 2001. So there's no difference in the video profile there, except go into the palette menu and change the color. 
and the border color. That looks better. I can definitely see this solution coming in handy, not just for capturing video like this, but for troubleshooting pets. If you're working on a headless pet on the bench, or if you're just trying to figure out if you have a bad monitor or a bad video output. This turnkey offering from TechSelect is pretty nice, and I definitely recommend it if you're in the market for one, although they are out of stock at the moment. Everybody seems to be out of stock on these things due to the parts shortage. And I just realized that because of the way I made the cable, that's blocking the user port, so I can't plug in my stupid Pitrix module at the same time in order to capture audio. So I guess I'm going to have to remake the cable and tie it in with this or, uh, or another similar module with the sound output because that will make it a lot easier to uh, remove when I need to and give me the ability to capture audio at the same time. Gold is near. Oh no, 57 points. Run away. An attack. Oh no, I'm dead. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching.